So let's talk about where we're at now and where we're headed. Um, down here, um, as you can see in the bottom left-hand corner, let's see if I can, yeah, right there, I got the, I got the pointer to work. Uh, this is what Town Square Park used to look like, this area right here. It was a blighted, empty four-acre site uh, that was, you know, uh, when I first took office, was surrounded by cyclone fencing and mattresses and a pile of rubble taller than me. Now, it's this beautiful trans transformation of our beautiful Town Square Park uh, where we can all gather on a daily basis with the, um, uh, the playground equipment right here and the tree that we gather around and the half-court basketball. And you can see there, that's where the Performing Arts and Events Center was under construction. Obviously, it's finished now. This is uh, when we opened it uh, back in 2016. It was great and uh, just really a, a great moment for this community. But it really is about transforming our downtown and transforming what was there. It's only been a few short years, but it's easy to forget what it used to look like. Uh, this is what our Performing Arts and Events Center looks like right now. We had our state, my State of the City address there. We'll show you a picture of that in a, in a moment. But recall, if you will, this is what it looked like before we did that. Actually, they let me in the backhoe for a few minutes to help knock down some of those walls. Um, and uh, uh, that was blighted, a, a, another uh, cyclone fencing around it. Now it's a beautiful Performing Arts and Events Center. And out of the $33 million dollars, uh, that it costs to construct that, uh, the, uh, we have come up with about 80, 85% of the funding of that, uh, $26 million. And so that's been, uh, we're looking on naming rights right now, and, and we're talking about that, that last little bit of it. But uh, we were able to come up with $26 million uh, with that Performing Arts and Events Center, which is transforming that area. This is actually, this, this, uh, when I was doing my, getting ready for my State of the City address, this picture from Google Earth, if you look at down, our, our downtown right now and just take it from that area, go to the satellite, this is actually what it looks like right now, this picture right here. But when I zoomed in, oops, I, well, when I zoomed in, actually that's not the, uh, the picture right there is what it looks like uh, right now with the Performing Arts and Events Center uh, over your corner. But it's just a transformation, just a beautiful transformation of what uh, our, our area looks like uh, right now. So obviously we've got, uh, we have the new management for the Performing Arts and Events Center. We just had Robert Cray sold out. We've got a number of, uh, we brought in a new company to actually run it to make sure it's done in a cost benefit analysis uh, way. This was the state of the city for this year. Now this is an interesting thing. See how many people are there for the state of the city? We used to do the state of the city at the Chamber of Commerce, and it was great. We did that for years and years and years. But every year, the, probably the maximum we could get into the Twin Lakes Golf and Country Club was about 175, maybe. We had more people attend one state of the city address this year than attended the entire state of the city addresses for my first term. And more importantly, it was during the evening where people could attend, and it was free to the public. So I really wanted to make sure that people had an opportunity to see uh, this area. So uh, now, again, we've got the Performing Arts and Events Center, and now for the next step. You know, we purchased the other area. What we're attempting to do is transform our downtown and create livable spaces and create a location where, where we're going to have connect all these places together. The burden has been, uh, previous to this, let's go back. So you can see right here, what separates the park from the Performing Arts and Events Center is a 30-foot wall, and it's a barrier. In order to get from the park and, and the transit center to the Performing Arts and Events Center, you've got to walk around this area. And the pack and the park are not really fully integrated. The idea is to create... Let's get there. The idea where there was once a wall is now going to be a place a place where we can recreate, gather, look at the views of the mountains. And um, that's actually what's right here. This is where the wall was going to be. And this and the park is on this side over here. So it's going to really, we're going to punch a hole. We're actually in the process of doing that right now. We're punching a hole in that wall. The excavation is, is going on right now. And really what you're going to have is, a, is a, 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 a situation where we're going to connect up the park, the pack, and another item which I'll talk about in just a few moments. But the funding for this all came from grant funding, state funding, King County lift funds, and funding that could only be used for capital projects. This is a capital investment. Uh, not, no operating funds were used uh, for this purpose. 
And the small amount of city funds were actually what they call real estate excise tax money, which can only be used for capital projects. Okay, so this is the Panther Lake Trail. If you haven't seen this, this is over there by the Aquatic Center. Uh, thanks to our King County Councilman, uh, Pete Von Reichbauer, we were able to capture, I think he got us uh, $800,000 for uh, this loop and the bridge and the, and the project. It looks beautiful. And again, investment in infrastructure. And there's us when we first... Uh, when we first started the trail, and here's just a couple of weeks ago when we opened it. If you haven't taken a quick walk over there, I would encourage you to do so. Um, the University Initiative. So this is a very exciting uh, initiative that we're working on. Uh, we got $500,000 from the legislature and ongoing monies. Uh, we're actually, uh, uh, it's called The Hub. It's a, uh, something that we're working on with the University of Washington Tacoma, Highline College, Federal Public Schools. The area where the former target is, is the target where we're going to, is the location where this eventually will be housed. The area, the, uh, you know where G. Moore is, right, right behind that, the Hillside Plaza? That's where the initial offerings are going to be. And then the plan is to have the hub, this higher education center, which would be good for our local students uh, and economic development and all of, the, uh, and all of it, uh, to house in that location. And uh, it really is. We've been talking about this for years and years, and it's actually happening. So we did the, uh, we did the uh, memorandum of understanding with Highline, UWT, and Federal Public Schools, and the city, I think, exactly two years ago. And now it's really, we're, classes should be offered as soon as uh, they're going to have a soft opening this summer, and then uh, this fall, classes will be offered there at the hub. Light rail. Light rail is obviously a big thing coming to our city. We're going to be talking about that. Uh, this is uh, right in our downtown. Uh, the McDonald's, if you will, is like right over here on, this is 320th, uh, right here. Uh, the Wendy's right there is, is right there. So the configuration, this is actually it coming swooping in off the freeway down here. It's going to come in here and loop in over there. The station will be right there. And then it's going to cross 320th. That's the mall right there. It's going to cross 320th, and eventually it's going to get back onto the freeway right there and then head down to 348th. Federal Way, see, what's happening is just the, the Federal Way that you know, that you've seen for the past several decades, will change forever. It's changing literally before our very eyes. And this investment of light rail is tens of millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars, of investment in infrastructure in our city. Just like in the schools, we're working in the school district, thanks to you, We've, uh, the, the community passed a half a billion dollars in funding for new schools. All this investment is coming into the city of Federal Way. So you're going to see massive investment. You're going to see a lot of change, but you're going to see a lot of investment in your downtown. Now, the location that we're talking about with the Performing Arts and Events Center is right over here. So this, here, here's the road right here. So the park is here, the Performing Arts and Events Center. All this is happening in a downtown that is, re that is essentially uh, changing before our very eyes. But it's going to sweep over there. It's going to cross 320th. It'll take out the Red Robin, the Azteca, uh, and, and uh, they're going to be uh, relocating, hopefully, very closely. Let's talk about Sound Transit real quick. They're going to obviously start at uh, 272nd in, when they enter Federal Way. It's going to come down to Federal Way. It'll eventually open in 2024. So I want to talk to you about our, our efforts with uh, I want to talk to you about our efforts with Sound Transit. Well, I actually uh, you may have noticed that the Arco in downtown closed recently, and then the Denny's on 320th closed. That's because Sound that's because Sound Transit is purchasing these properties. So I called Peter Rogoff myself, and, and I've been working with the council. We're actually having a study session before the next city council meeting on May 7th to make sure, and I, I communicated to, to Peter Rogoff, that we cannot, as a community, allow these properties to sit empty for five years while, while, while light rail is being constructed. We also are not going to sit by and watch them get filled with graffiti and transients uh, camping on them. So we've got to make sure that we are watching this very carefully, and you know, we've got a commitment from them uh, from Sound Transit to make sure that we're working hand in hand. But we need to make sure that we've got either interim uses and make sure that uh, for those properties and make sure that they don't really look like a blight in the middle of our downtown. Change is good, but it's got to work for us, even in the interim. So we've got new management, new, not new management, but new ownership at the mall. And uh, they've got some, uh, some big plans and what they're doing. And uh, I'm not going to get too far into it other than uh, these, uh, let's go back a step. In the, uh, 
Actually, let's talk about right here. Mama Stortini's is going where the old McGrath's is, and that's going to open up in just about a month, and that's going to be a great, uh, great issue. Yeah, it's going to be great. Uh, Trapper's Sushi is coming over there. That's over there by PetSmart. Um, and back over there where the Tokyo uh, Steakhouse is, uh, right in that corner, if you haven't seen the signs yet. And that's a great, it's going to be a great restaurant. Um, Diagnostex is, uh, is over on the West Campus. KCD's is going to be over in Twin Lakes. Um, we've got the, uh, remember where Marista's was? And remember how uh, Marista's closed? A new Starbucks is going to go in there. And there's a new Starbucks actually where the Winco is. Um, California Burrito, uh, Newmeyer Construction. Newmeyer Construction is actually, uh, uh, is actually working on 100,000 square feet of, of a new building uh, here in Federal Way. Um, and DeVita, DeVita is actually building another building in Federal Way. They've, they're over there, do you know where the KOAM uh, station is on the east side of the freeway on 32nd? They've got a building there right now. They're building another building they're going to spend tens of millions of dollars on that. It could increase their number of employees by about 1,000 over the years. So a lot of stuff happening in regard to economic development. Um, we're really proud of Elenos. Elenos is going national, and that's down there uh, where the Bodden, remember the Bodden Sports uh, area is, back behind where Christian Faith Center is? Uh, it's right behind there. They've invested millions of dollars in that facility, and that's going to be a, just an absolute... Um, uh, they've got rooms as big as this with containers and, and machines, and it's just absolutely amazing what they've done over there, and employing over 150 people, I believe. Um, we've got our downtown as part of the economic opportunity zone. We're working with that. The council passed that, and uh, we're working on making sure that we get investment in certain areas. These are things we're doing in community engagement, obviously. Um, and we're obviously making sure that we're picking up and cleaning up this community. Actually, just a few weeks ago, you guys had a graffiti wall off Hoyt, off Hoyt and down over uh, by the intersection where there were those houses were on the wall. And uh, uh, within you know, just a matter of a few hours, we, had, we were actually working with the Homeowners Association. But you know, those things kind of take time. At some point, I just said, I just directed our staff to get over there, get some paint, get that wall covered. We are not going to have graffiti in your neighborhood, my neighborhood, anyone's neighborhood, especially gang graffiti that, that sends, that all sends the wrong message, but especially uh, any kind of indicia of, of gang activity or gang affiliations. We take that off the next day, as soon as we see it. And so um, I just want to let you know that's something that is an absolute uh, uh, necessity and a, and a priority for us. In fact, now I have a management team meeting every Monday with the directors, the uh, directors of the departments, <clears throat> and I have added a permanent item on that agenda, which is graffiti report. And from the community development director and the police department, I get pictures of what it's of what the graffiti says, and I want to know the locations because we had a flurry of it. I did hear from Community Watch. We had a flurry of it on 312th, on Hoyt on 336 on campus. So I, you know, where, whenever, and I, I even drive around personally, and I'm looking for that graffiti around town because we are not going to let that fester in our community, not even for a day. So, and then you probably heard about the uh, shopping carts. This is a, a, just a staggering number. Last year, we pulled 2,000 shopping carts off the streets and the woods of this community. And I just said, we're not, that's not going to happen anymore. We are going to put our foot down. And because what that does right there, that is a symbol of decline. When you see that in your neighborhood, on your street, and when you're driving around Federal Way, that is unacceptable. So that's another thing that I would do. My son, Benjamin, who's 11, uh, he's like, Dad, why do you keep calling in? What, what number are you calling in with these shopping carts? And I'm like, if I see them, I call them in and because we need to get them picked up. And so we passed an ordinance here in the city of Federal Way, and you know, it was, you know, admittedly, it was, a little, it was a little controversial at first, because what we said to the owners of these carts and these grocery stores is, you have the ability, because you, know, you can't prosecute your way out, and we can probably disagree about this, but you can't prosecute your way out of people walking down the street with a shopping cart about what those circumstances are. But what we can say is, if we recover a cart, and it belongs to a certain store, if, if, they, if the owner of that cart wants it back, it's going to cost a fee. If they, uh, if they don't get it back, then it's going to cost a little bit more for us to have to recycle it. But what we need, we have finally put some teeth into making sure that we do not have cart 
lines as long as this gymnasium coming out of the woods. You, if you're interested in seeing some of these pictures, you wouldn't, even, you wouldn't even believe it. Across the street from Joe's Deli on 336th, there were hundreds and hundreds of shopping carts in that wooded area that we eventually had cleaned out. And that the people that owned that had to pay tens of thousands of dollars to clean that out. And that's something we're doing. We're going to talk about that in a moment in regard to homeless encampment cleanup. This, this, you guys, I'm sure you guys drive past this every day on 320th, that long, long stretch between 21st and, fir between 21st and 11th. I was looking at this stretch of fence almost every day for years and years and said, we need to get some paint on this fence. So this is a bunch of volunteers. Thank goodness for all the volunteers. Shelly Shelley Pauls is just an angel, and she was able to get a bunch of folks together. And in just a few hours, we got that whole area painted. We're gonna, this is a yearly occurrence we're going to be doing. And uh, litter pickup, that's a major priority for this community. We've got the red, white, and blues coming again. Obviously, uh, 4th of July, we usually get over 20,000 people in, in that, and we, our, our Parks Department just does a phenomenal job with that. Um, we heard about crime being down, and uh, obviously, uh, you heard that entire presentation, but it's something, this is our number one priority, bar none. It's our number one, two, and three priority. It's, it is the core responsibility of any government at any level to keep you safe. And so, trust me, this is, this is a priority for us. So, if, if you take anything from this, just know that this is what we watch all the time. Okay, we've got, as, as Susan mentioned before, we've got a Susan, uh, I announced at my State of the uh, City address that uh, we're launching a Seniors Commission and to talk about all the issues in the City of Federal Way, not just issues uh, specific to seniors. But there's so much institutional knowledge and so much life knowledge that we really want to make sure that we've got people who are committed to our community who can contribute. And so uh, that's up and running. That's something we've been talking about for a long time. In addition to the Deputy Mayor, I want to thank uh, Councilmember Martin Moore, who talked about this for a long time. And uh, there are so many people out there. I know, I know Councilmember Johnson has been interested, and the Deputy Mayor as well. So a lot of folks talking about this issue, and we finally uh, went ahead and did that. And then we've got a Veterans um, uh, Committee. Uh, Roger Flygar, I, I placed uh, as, the, uh, as, as now the chair of that. And that's, remember there was some discussion about how we could best honor our veterans and, um, and how we can do that in a meaningful way. Uh, so there's a committee talking about how we can do that. The, the search of uh, the, the section of 320th where the flagpole is and in our downtown, that's honorarily named Veterans Way. And so there's some discussion about what we're going to do there. But I could tell you that what we're working on right now is making sure that uh, with veterans and with people and with stakeholders in our community, we're working on a way that we can really have a place that uh, and, and have some sort of uh, honorary, honoring of veterans in our community that, that speaks to our community and their commitment and sacrifice. Um, we've been working, actually simultaneous to this meeting, as the Deputy Mayor mentioned, there is a, uh, an issue about air traffic noise. This is the report uh, that my office uh, put out along with some, uh, some key experts in our community about recommendations. Those recommendations are now going through the council. And we're working on making sure we're very, very engaged. In fact, this is me testifying before the Port of Seattle earlier. Um, actually, it was uh, toward the end of last year um, before the uh, Port Commission about airplane noise. And with the plans that they have with the airport, if we're not careful, you know, our quality of life is going to be materially affected. And so that's something that we're engaging. But I always say it's like a three-dimensional chess game between, you know, the FAA, the port, the state legislative matter, uh, the, the federal delegation. It's, it really is, we, you know, when we weighed in on this, we wanted to make sure that we're doing so in a meaningful way and not just sort of uh, flailing at the machinery of, of this three-dimensional game, three-dimensional three process. So that's what we're working on right now. And uh, the key thing is we need to make sure that people can enjoy their homes, open their windows, have conversations outside without, um, you know, without being interfered with. And frankly, your home is the most, you know, is really the, the, the principal investment that you make uh, with your family. And we need to make sure that our property values hold and that our quality of life uh, stays true. There are, there are times, actually, in Marine Hills and certain areas of the community, sometime around here, sometimes around here, I'm sure, where you can't talk to someone that's standing right next to you. And it's, it's, it's not good. And we need to really be careful of that. And so we need to make sure that we're protecting our way of life here. So we did a great job. Our, our staff just did a tremendous job with the snow removal and everything. And you see these cameras? This is something new we did this year about watching in real time, uh, making sure that we knew what the conditions were all over the community and communicating about it. And then this is actually 
uh, uh, Ray Gross, our emergency uh, uh, manager, our police chief, and EJ, you met earlier, and we're downstairs at City Hall setting up um, for what could have been a, a, the necessity to set up our emergency operations center. We were concerned that Sunday, um, this was actually this was the snowiest February in the past hundred years, and probably the, sm the, the fifth snowiest or, or coldest um, in, in recorded history. So I think it was you know, since 19, 19, 1917, uh, this was the fifth, uh, or this was the, the uh, coldest and most snow. So we, uh, had there been a frozen rain event that Sunday, we would have had to, and, and had there been uh, massive power outages, or even moderate power outages, we likely would have activated the emergency operations center to make sure that we're taking care of it. It wasn't, ne it wasn't necessary, though. So we're working on homelessness. This, this is uh, the report that we put out on homelessness. It's available on the website, something we're working on a, a great deal. Um, you know, we're really uh, engaged, you know, trying to help people as best we can. And then uh, this is a group of uh, faith-based and community-based organizations and individuals that I brought together on several occasions just recently a few weeks ago to talk about making sure that we've got plans in place for severe weather and how we can shelter people. Not for long term, but when we've got, when we've got a severe weather event that's posing a life safety risk, we absolutely need to have a place to go, or they do. This is a homeless encampment that, uh, this is actually what really started the homeless encampment cleanup initiative. This is down there behind uh, the Burger King on, uh, off of Pack Highway. This is just an example of what some of the encampments look like around town. And uh, most of the times when we encounter the camps uh, like this, uh, they're abandoned or, or they just have a few people on them. We have cleaned up literally dozens of these camps to ensure that we're picking up the needles, the garbage, the stolen property. You can see the shopping cart here and here and, and over here. Um, this is just, we, we can't allow that to, to fester. If we allowed this to fester without doing something about it, this community would be overtaken. And so we have cleaned up literally dozens. I'd like to thank Deputy Chief Steve Neal, the police department, our code compliance folks, who have been working very hard on this. Yeah, it is a mess. And especially that area I was telling you about across the street on 336, across the street from Joe's Deli, that, I still have the pictures from that. That was absolutely, was on private property, but I went in there with about you know, 10 officers, 10 code, 10 code compliance officers, and uh, I just, I just, we just informed them, this needs to be cleaned up right away. And they spent tens of thousands of dollars doing so. But at some point we say, you clean it up or you're gonna get fined. This is, it's just not acceptable. Yes, sir. There, there is no, well, well, I'll talk about that. He asked, the gentleman asked about, are we enforcing the ban on camping? We're gonna talk about that in a moment. Um, let's see here. So city initiatives, we've got, we're leaving the SCORE jail. SCORE jail cost increased by 173%. We're going to net $2.1 million more per year by contracting with other jails as opposed to using the SCORE jail. And um, uh, in regard to the budget, we closed a million dollar per year operating ga uh, gap um, to, ensure that, um, uh, to ensure that we didn't have to lay anybody off, we didn't have to raise taxes. And, um, you know, last, it was about, this is April, so last March, our uh, finance director, a day, hold on, <coughs> a day in Rulo, told us that we were going to have to dip into our strategic reserves a million dollars a year just to make payroll and just to keep where we're at. And I just said, no, we're not. That's not going to happen. We're not going to dip into strategic, strategic reserves for a million dollars. We will find the money. And so we tightened up our belt as, as tight as we possibly could, and we did everything we could to make sure that we did not have to raise your taxes or lay anybody else off, and we did. But now we really are in a situation in which we need more revenue in the city. Uh, because we have we've squeezed every dollar out and that's why this two million dollars from the uh, score jail savings is going to come in handy and we also have uh, you know right now um, that's going to be 2.1 million dollars per year we have biennial budgets two-year budget so that's going to be four million dollars 4.2 million dollars and then as, as you may uh, recall uh, the city uh, imposed a uh, water and utility excise tax on t um, Lake Haven, and then Lake Haven sued the city of Federal Way. We won at the district court level, and now that's being, uh, now that's being uh, appealed by them up to the next level. If we prevail at that, we will have a million dollars more per year, about $900,000 more per year to provide services uh, for you. So that's, that's pending. 